Hi everyone, welcome to our latest ILS NYC broadcast. Um, please do visit the event website to see the details of our kind sponsors who help us put on this event, as well as to view all the video content from previous sessions. So we're continuing to look at the development of ILS with a one eye to the future as ever. And this year we focus on defining the next generation, which is a particularly lofty goal, but uh, we're joined by another industry expert and luminary who can help us with this. I'm delighted to have Michael Millett, founder and managing partner of Hudson Structured Capital Management with me today. Thanks for joining, Michael. Thank you, Steve. Great to see you in the middle of this extended crisis that we're all enduring. Yes, good to see you too. So today we're going to discuss Michael's views on the forward looking development of the insurance, reinsurance and ILS market, particularly around sort of capital um, velocity. Um, and in particular, also the fact that Michael believes that the industry could change more in the next decade than it has in the last 70 years, um, which is an intriguing prospect. But to begin, just wanted to sort of set the scene and perhaps you could give our listeners and, and viewers a bit of an overview of your thesis for investing in insurance, reinsurance and ILS. Um, what makes it attractive? What has the industry done well in its 25 year history? And perhaps also what has it missed out on? What sort of opportunities could it have missed on the way? No, thank, thanks, Steve. Um, and, and first of all, let me mark right now the Artemis calendar for an anniversary celebration this year, um, DEES 23, because that was the pricing date for Georgetown Re, which was the first broadly distributed cap bond. Um, it was so harrowing that that date, you know, along with, you know, birthdays of my children will always be <laughs> tattooed on my memory. Um, and so it has been very nearly um, 25 years. In fact, we probably started structuring Georgetown 25 years ago today. The deal took a whole year. Mm. So what was our thesis then? Um, four parts, and, and the sector has executed on three of them. First, this insurance risk is potentially um, lightly correlated with the broader capital markets. Important then, more important now, because what we've had over this quarter century is accelerating correlation. You know, investors have been concerned about correlation for decades. It's been part of, you know, Markowitzian investment theory. Um, but what we've seen is technology um, and communication have caused the capital markets to spin faster and faster. You know, from if if we start out with the collapse of the Bear Stearns mortgage funds and end up with the collapse of um, Lehman Brothers. That ran from July of or June of 2007 till September of 2008. The onset of correlation and destruction of the markets took over a little over a year. Mm -hmm. um, from the time that coronavirus um, started to spread in mid in, in January until the time that essentially all markets collapsed in early March was was a matter of weeks. Um, the next crisis will be a few days. We will see markets around the world cascade. So non-correlation is more important than it was, and this quality of the insurance market is more important than it was. Uh, the second is quantification. Um, this industry has, has had risk quantification for hundreds of years. Um, the actuarial profession um, was formed for that purpose, and it dates back into the 19th century, even even with precursors in the 18th century. You know, in the early days of of, of Lloyd's and other insurers, um, and this is really novel. You know, the capital markets are very self congratulatory about their relative sophistication, um, but actually, quantitative risk measurement was really not a deep part of credit until you know the 1990s. The insurance industry has had risk quantification, you know, the actuaries, the tariff books, and then onto computers, and then and then you know the risk modeling firms, first in CAT, and then in all sorts of you know actuarial consulting firms. There's this huge infrastructure. Um, a third, price per unit of risk in this industry is better than credit. Um, that doesn't mean you can't make bad choices because you can, but it's potentially better. You know, double B credit is more or less one in a hundred risk. 
you know, double B, the long term double B loss given default, if you look at Moody's data, is just under 100 bips for mid double B. Um, one in 100 risk in the capital markets, um, you, you, you typically get a spread with a two handle, sometimes with a one handle, meaning that you're getting um, two times or less um, units of spread per unit of risk. You, you essentially almost always get more than three points. Um, for one in 100 risk in the insurance markets. A lot of investors hold out for four points or more. So um, the price per unit of risk, um, that that divergence has moved together over 25 years, but it hasn't converged. So you potentially have a better price per unit of risk. Uh, the fourth quality that, that we have perhaps not executed well on, and I'll talk about that, is um, not only is the industry not well correlated with the broader capital markets, but the industry has um, dozens of subsectors that are not well correlated with each other. You know, longevity risk is not well correlated with cat risk, is not well correlated with DNO, um, which in turn is not well correlated with uh, marine and energy, which is not well correlated with casualty runoff. So, you know, that is. That is just dazzling mm. to, to be lightly correlated and then to have non-correlation internally. That is exciting. So what's happened over the past 25 years? $100 billion of cap capacity. In turn, so over $100 billion in um, catastrophe-oriented funds and, and even more than that if you count um, bits of cap that have drifted into other portfolios. Material amounts of capacity have formed and entered into runoff life insurance, um, runoff casualty. So we have three sectors. You know, CAT is still mainly in the traditional reinsurance markets, but um, some of the deal driving portions of the CAT sector, like retro in Florida, are, are really very, very strongly influenced by um, the capital markets. In some ways, retro is, is really driven out of the capital markets. Mm -hmm. Um, which isn't a surprise. Retro is always awkward for the industry. Um, you're giving capital to all your competitors. Um, you know, runoff casualty, runoff life insurance are really influenced. Look at runoff life insurance. Look at this week. Look at I, I mean, it's it's Friday, so five days this week. We've had we've had three different companies: um, Allstate, and then American Financial, and then Jackson National. Um, we've had three different life insurance. Uh, essentially investment-based life insurance businesses spin out of other entities, two of them out of PC groups, one of them out of a European group. Um, and, 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 and some of that is the runoff market at work. You know, in, in some of those, it, the American financial case was, was PC insurer to life insurer, but Allstate went into Blackstone, Allstate Life. So, um, in, and on the PNC side, um, we have about 10 specialty companies. So, Success is, you know, the emergence of runoff capacity, the emergence of cap capacity has helped the insurance industry to manage its risk and its balance sheet more skillfully. Um, it is the reason why Florida homeowners have reasonably consistent insurance available. It's the reason why California homeowners are gaining on the possibility of having consistent fire and shake um, available to them. So that's success. Mm -hmm. um, where where has it fallen short? You know, and, and, uh, let me let me score another success. Uh, another success is um, I think that having so many eyes on the models and moving the quantitative culture in the industry from this almost you know, from this slightly secretive and monastic culture where companies carefully guarded, you know, that each country, a company had a, its own actuarial mandrinate, which, which protected, you know, bespoke data, even from people in their own firm. And, you know, what we've seen in 25 years of capital markets is a public dialogue of risk quantification emerge. And, and it's, it, and, there's value in that because it helps us to understand risk better. We we talk about things like storm surge and demand surge and trapped capital issues. And 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 that public dialogue is adding to the quality of risk analysis. 
So that's a success. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm pleased you mentioned that actually, because um, a lot of people don't talk enough about the sharing of information and data and how, how valuable that is as the industry develops, especially as it begins to develop its pace. Um, you mentioned accelerating change in capital markets over the years. Um, everything seems to be accelerating right now in our lives, in our work, in, in the economy in general. Um, what do you see as key drivers that could spill over from that and perhaps accelerate the rate of change in reinsurance, insurance and ILS as well? Well, I'm, I'm going to answer that. But first of all, just to the, the tag end of your last question, you asked about success over 25 years, less success over 25 years. You know, one of the things, one of our theses consistently over time was that it's a balkanized industry and capital doesn't flow fluidly from place to place. You know, I've always been an enormous admirer of, of Berkshire Hathaway because one of the things that they do particularly well is they show up with capital mm. where there is trouble and shortage. And that is, you know, a, a thinly veiled secret of their success. They've always been they've always shown up um, where 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 there is actual actually some cheapness and some value. Um, and one of the things um, in the capital markets is we thought that that would, you know, cause capital to show up more fluidly. And it does. But, you know, what we've seen is we had all these specialized insurance companies that didn't move capital around um, as graciously as they could. And now we have the same thing in the capital markets. We have all sorts of hyper specialized funds. You know, not only are they cap funds, but they're only ILWs or they're only retro. And so, you know, those are those are those are um, sometimes they're cheap, sometimes they're rich. And and, you know, that addressing the movement of capital across the industry is something that the sector should continue to do better. You know, there's always chatter like there's a lot of chatter and scuttlebutt now that, that there should be more capital markets present presence in cyber. Um, but, you know, there's there's not a huge mechanism for it um, because most funds don't have mandates that they can just, you know, wander over there into that area of, of, of potential value. So acceleration, accelerate. So what you said is like, you know, it's it's in some ways it's a commonplace, except now it isn't because, you know, things feel as though they've been accelerating in some ways for our whole lifetimes. Um, but actually, you know, describe COVID in, in, in four words. COVID is an accelerant. Mm. COVID is, and, and you and I talked about this before. COVID's an accelerant here. COVID, you know, ties have been dying for, for many years. And I'm not sure why I wore one today. Maybe out of sheer nostalgia because, <laughs> because, COVID is, is, is going to drive a stake through the heart of, of the Thai industry, you know, and, 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 you know, all sorts of other, all sorts of other industries. It's certainly, it is accelerated streaming television. It's accelerated the demise of cinemas. You can go through and COVID has certainly accelerated the development of insurance in particular. COVID has been a real accelerant around um, the development of the insure tech branch of the industry and and its and its displacement of, of traditional companies and and one way one factoid that 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 we actually processed internally you know over the past few weeks is because of recent IPOs there is uh, more market capitalization now in insure tech or 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 reasonably adjacent tech enabled companies than there is in Bermuda. So, you know, the there wasn't a public Bermuda industry, you know, 35 years ago. And and you know, the development of this mass, there were captives in Bermuda, but there weren't, you know, there there just weren't that many freestanding companies in Bermuda. The development of the Bermuda industry and the development of its culture has been one of the most interesting things in the industry in our lifetime. And InsureTech, after moving very slowly for a long time, has gone from essentially, you know, from trivial market cap a couple of years ago to now exceeding uh, the market capitalization of Bermuda.
Mm, yeah, which is a fascinating development and um, that really shows no sign of slowing down right now either. And there's some very interesting things coming down the pipeline in that space for sure. Um, SPACs and speed, SPACs and speed. SPACs are an accelerant. Corona's an accelerant. Yeah, every, everything, as as you said, moving faster right now, whether perceived or reality. But yes, Corona certainly accelerated a lot of that and, and, and also brought a lot of uncertainty with it as well. Um, do you think the combination of uncertainty and the accelerating change, do you, do you feel incumbents might struggle to keep up in some cases? Well, I think that the reason, you know, you and I talked about your opening comment, which is maybe the industry will change more in the next 10 years than it has in the past 70. And, and you know, people's views notwithstanding, I haven't been in the industry for all of those 70 years. Uh, although, you know, I course was studying it as a small child um, but there is a good the, the reason to think about that has has little to do with cap we have to look at a much more basic level let's talk about auto you know 40 percent of insurance industry premiums you know since world war ii auto has been the bedrock it's been mm -hmm. the hull of the industry you know everything else is arranged on top of it it's huge it generates titanic amounts of flow. It has, it is reasonably, um, you know, almost entirely frequency risk. It, auto risk is, 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 is very susceptible to pooling, which is a fundamental economic function of insurers. You know, this, in some ways, the modern insurance industry, you know, rests on a foundation of auto. Well, what's going on now? Everything is changing. Like the auto, the auto, you know, in, in, in the aftermath of World War II, you know, throwing the family into the car, going for a weekend trip, you know, driving to work, like that culture in, in, in the Western world has remained reasonably consistent through the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, you know, the past 20 years. Um, let's start on the auto side. Shared, electronic, autonomous. So shared. I, I don't know how many of you live in the suburbs, but you may have noticed that, you know, sometimes it, it feels like pulling teeth to get your kids to go and get their licenses. Um, and, you know, I, I was able to get a permit in Massachusetts at 15 and a half. I, I think I jumped out of bed that morning, like ready to, you know, auto, my, uh, auto freedom was fundamental. And it's become like much less, much more sort of casual. Like, you know, you, you know, buddy, you're 17. Shouldn't you go get your license? <laughs> and, you know, and shared as part of that because, you know, why not just call an Uber or, or, or a Lyft um, or, or one of the other brands? And, you know, shared is displacing a certain amount of driving. So that's one. Electronic. Um, Electronic is is in a, in an accelerating mode now. I think that over the next two years, you when when you and I have this twenty four months from now, Steve, where everybody will have talked over the holidays at year end twenty twenty two about how they're worried about buying an ICE car internal combustion engine because what's the resale value going to be? Yeah. Because the pricing of batteries is crashing in, range anxiety is dissipating. Let me let me give you a new concept: range anxiety in gasoline. Have you all noticed that there are fewer gas stations than there used to be? Like there there are like half as many in Manhattan as there were ten years ago, mm. and and half as many in in the neighborhood here, and um, you know. People, it, so the, the range anxiety is dissipating and, and, and morphing. Um, electronic cars, you know, the dealers. Electronic cars have 80% fewer moving parts. Like dealers live on service. They don't yeah. live on selling cars. You know, so this is a deep disruption of the auto economy. You're going to have to have new types of leasing because you have this battery purchase. Um, because you have fewer moving parts, there's just less wear and tear in the car. And then autonomous. So let's think about autonomous and shared interacting. Like there, right now, 
you know, the vast majority of cars in the United States run two hours a day. Like they, you, you, you drive them here and there, like, like 22 hours a day, the car sits undriven. If you have electronic cars and shared cars, electronic cars can drive 500,000 miles potentially, you know, like my, my cars give out, you know, at 140 or something like that, but you know, you can keep driving them and, and they, and if, and if you have an electronic car that is autonomous, that knows when it's time to get ready to go, it can go and hook itself up and, and then unhook itself. That car can be on the road for, you know, 14 hours a day. Mm. Um, you don't need as many cars. Like there are sort of people all drive at certain times of day, but that'll even out a little bit. Like people are going to really start worrying about the value of their cars. Um, the, the, once you have comprehensive autonomy and shared vehicles, that starts to crush the economics of individual car ownerships. If you have an electronic car that is autonomous, that can run for 14 hours a day without a paycheck attached to it, that can transport you so much more cheaply than, than if you go and buy the car and sit it in your driveway or in a parking space. God forbid you have to rent a parking space in London or New York City. So, and, and you know, w when you score those trends out 10 years from now, we're going to be sitting with a primarily electric fleet. And we're going to be sitting in the early stages of much larger scale autonomous development. There are autonomous cars running in 30 cities in the U.S. right now. They're not widespread, but the experimental versions are, 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 are running. So, you know, what does that do? I mean, if you, if, if you, you, first of all, you move from, from, from individual car insurance to fleets. A lot of people don't have cars, like they don't need insurance. Um, you know, the industry, what is the industry? And, and, and auto becomes like a cat business because your problem is that like the systems break down or it becomes like cyber. Or business interruption. You know, it, it 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 completes the transformation of this industry from the 20th century incarnation of insurance, which was insuring physical goods, to the 21st century, which is insuring processes. Yeah. So, you know, what does the industry look like? Like 40% of the industry drops out. We haven't even picked through the other 60%. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fascinating because. So, Auto is obviously uh, fundamental to the industry right now, but as, and, as and then suggested. and then the way that and forget about the cars. Let's talk about the insurance. Like, you know, they, actually one of the there, there have been some like hilarious moments in the development of catastrophe. But one of them was a meeting that we sat through. Um, my, you know, Andy Kaiser and I like fifteen years ago, or maybe twenty years ago where somebody was proposing to us, could you do cat bonds for glacier risk? And we, we looked at each other and we were like, I think you can see that one coming. Like, you know, climate change is no joke, but like a glacier is not gonna just show up and roll over your house. Like that, just, you see that one coming like for a couple hundred years, like inching along. So no, there's not a surprise factor, okay? Um, and, but in auto insurance, like the biggest development since World War II is that every year the direct companies pound a few hundred million more dollars into advertising and then take a couple points of share from the indirect companies. Like yeah. it's a glacier moving. Like that's, it, it's, it's movement, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's glacial. Um, and, you know, but that's going to change quickly. Like we, most, most, Brits, most Americans sat around for the past 12 months, uh, 10 months at this point, and looked at their cars sitting idle in their driveway or their car park and realized I'm paying my whole auto insurance premium and, and the car is not moving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the auto insurers rallied and gave, you know, so 50% less driving and there were like 15% premium rebates and auto was a big money maker this year. You know, that creates product market fit around things like pay per mile insurance and continuous underwriting. So, you know, that people, the way that people are insured is going to change. The way they buy insurance is going to change. The cars are going to change. It's so exciting. Like, yeah. this is, you know, whereas, whereas, you know, my grandparents bought insurance for their car the same way I do. Mm. That's, 
No, it's a complete change coming. And, uh, and uh, as you say, that's just one small product in the insurance industry and um, changes coming through so that's many other product. categories as well. Yeah. Yes, a, a small product that makes big up a product. big proportion of the industry, yeah. Big product. Now, if you look at the other 60% of this industry, you know, at World War II, it was, I, I alluded to it. The, the primary task of the industry was to ensure physical stuff against destruction. The primary task of the industry today is to ensure business processes and intellectual property, cyber risk, uh, reputation, um, business interruption. That's what people actually need. Now, the industry is kind of doing that on forms that were developed in the 1950s. And, and, and you know, we, we now see, you know, the FCA and the British Supreme Court and, and courts in America trying to sort through the mess because people, you know, people don't need the insurance they have and they don't have the insurance they need. And, you know, the agency force hasn't explained that, um, you know, eloquently. So that other 60% is going to change too. I proposed to you uh, previously that the whole rest of the industry has to just flip over. Instead of having physical insurance policies that have intangible riders, we have to have process, you know, intangible insurance policies that have physical riders because, you know, 70 plus percent of the value of the S&P these days is intangible. Yeah, yeah. Maybe more. And that's that's fundamental change coming through every industry in the world right now, and insurance is going to have to catch up and keep pace with that to provide the protection people need. Um, so, as well as the product side, which you've you've explained well there, um, so how do you think um, capital flows into the industry are going to change to support this type of accelerating new development of risk categories and products? Well, you know, that, that, that has been an important disruption in the industry that has gone along way over the past 25 years. Um, actually, let me stretch that out to the past 30 years. Um, you know, starting, starting in the early 1990s, um, we had a massive change in the, you know, the industry had a pretty consistent capital regime from the Great Depression until about 1990. Um, it was public stock companies um, and very little else. You know, during there, there were fairly high regulatory barriers between the industry um, and the rest of the markets. And in fact, the companies were had a tremendous amount of, of historical momentum. Um, starting in in 1990, the first the first wave of capital into the industry was the new coast. Mm. You know, in the Actually, let's even go before, in the late 80s, um, we saw the first generation of new codes. It was the Bermuda Ace, Excel, um, OIL, Center, you know, were all created to deal with the liability crisis in the U.S. So the liability crisis in the U.S. was the, was the first um, father of change in capital. And then the second father or mother, uh, two mothers, two fathers, father and mother, of change was... Um, the, the the catastrophe. We had this odd 20 year break from catastrophes in the 70s and 80s. But from 89 to 95, we had Hugo, Andrew, Dario, Vivian, BP, Herta, Northridge, Kobe. And, and that reminded people that there was cat risk in the world. So, you know, the courts and the cats drove, first of all, the creation of the new co's. And we've had at least four generations of new co's. Um, since since the mid 80s, and then drove the development of, of, of capital markets products. So that's huge, because you've got 100 billion of built up cat capacity, you've got 100 billion of other stray capacity and, you know, runoff companies and the like. And then, and then Bermuda, uh, in, including companies that have, you know, that, that no longer trade in Bermuda, but they're Bermuda origin, you know, Bermuda's probably, you know, a, a healthy $100 billion of market cap as well. So three waves, and um, you know that has made well, you know, uh, it's made the industry functional because the industry that existed when I was in high school in the early '80s um, would not have been able to deal with the the waves of liability crisis and the waves of cat crisis that we've seen um, since that time. Like it's it's not clear how the old industry would have functioned. In fact. It's 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 more interesting to look back at that you know that that fun like 
period between the Great Depression and the 80s, you know, lots of change. I mean, a world war. But from the industry's perspective, most stuff was consistent. You know, cat activity was manageable. Um, casualty wasn't, you know, yet a major. You know, Lloyd's of London and the traditional American companies all thrived in that period. So, you know, the 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 waves of capital have disrupted the industry and and allowed it to adapt to the world. You know, one curiosity that we talk about a lot in this industry, though, that's interesting, is, you know, we can talk about change and disruption. But one of the things about this industry is the, the, the gorgeous antiquity of many of the companies. You know, how many industries do you go through where every day, like many, many of the companies you deal with are 100 years old? You know, and, you know, it, lots of hundred year old. It, in fact, you, you walk up the street, you walk, you know, up Front Street past town toward the Princess in Bermuda, and you pass two of them sitting right next to each other, Oxa and Chubb, hundred year old companies. Except they're not, except they're not, because that's Ace and Excel, mm -hmm. um, which, but it goes to, you know, the industry is very good at having a cycle of, formation of capital outside of the big, rigid, old school companies, and then absorbing those into those companies where they, where they nourish the company with talent and tech and, and, and effectively endogenize disruption. So, you know, it, it, it's always tempting to get carried away. You know, the industry is old school. It needs to be disrupted. The industry is actually very good at disrupting itself. Yeah. better than most industries most industries are not as good as disrupting themselves like the yellow pages terrible job <laughs> i remember i worked on the yellow pages gorgeous annuity like industries this was in like the early 2000s like people said you know your aunt is never going to look up you know a, a restaurant on the phone i got news my aunt is never going to look up a restaurant in the yellow pages because she looks it up on her phone she can press and she you know, she can look at the people, you know, that that industry needed, you know, needed to be internally disrupted. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so if that's the, the three waves of capital that you've seen or noted um, that have made a big difference so far. Um, yeah. if, if we look ahead sort of and how capital is going to flow in, one of the ways that we're now seeing is the special purpose acquisition company or SPAC, which um, yeah. Hudson structured as working on or work, sponsoring one. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about why you went down that route and what you see as the benefits of that, aside from just um, perhaps broadening access to more investors or more capital? Well, I mean, SPACs are not new, um, and they existed as a sort of, a, you know, on the sidelines of, of mainstream equity markets for quite a long time. Um, but you know, a whole series of forces have converged to make SPACs very relevant. Uh, you know, arguably, it's 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 you know they they are part of of some effervescence in the markets. But there's some real underliers to SPACs. Uh, number number one, SPACs effectively create a buy side to the IPO market. Mm. You know, one of the historic issues with the IP, IPO market is asymmetry of information. You know the Investors can't really, it's hard for investors to really penetrate and know deeply, you know, the company that's IPOing. Um, in effect, the SPAC creates a vehicle through which investors deputize a group to do deep months long due diligence in advance of the D SPAC, which is effectively the IPO of the company being merged into the SPAC. So, number one, SPACs create a buy side. Um, for the IPO known market. Number two, if interest rates are close to zero, why not tie up money in a box for a while? Mm. You know that. So SPACs are a little bit reliant on the low rate environment that we have right now. Um, so without without going into whether or not we should expect that to change, I think that SPACs will be a fixture of, of very low rates. Um, um, number three. We are in a time of enormous change in many industries. So that means that many companies 
uh, need to IPO, and SPACs are a particularly gracious way for companies to IPO, especially when we have such a ragged, event-laden world that companies need to face. You know, an IPO sequence, you know, you're signing up to spend, you know, a couple of years getting it financials ready, hiring bankers. You know, the, the SPAC timeframe compresses that um, for a company and makes the market more reliable. Um, so in in choppy markets in a choppy world, the SPAC, you know, the SPAC construct can be valuable. So there are all sorts of reasons that we're seeing SPACs right now. Um, and all of those apply to, to um, this industry. Um, and SPACs have been a substantial accelerant for InsureTech. Um, we have a whole, right, you know, Clover Health is now a publicly trading health insurer that is a multi-billion dollar market cap company yeah. that, you know, approaches health insurance in a somewhat different way. And, and they now have the heft to um, compete in more states, um, in more regions. You know, Clover, Clover is, is a company in, in the counties. We got to talk, we got to talk about counties now. Clover not only picked New Jersey, but it picked counties. But in the counties where Clover chose to penetrate, it's become the leading insurer. Like they have a different approach to health insurance um, that has been very, very effective. So the SPAC market permits Clover to grow that and project that across more of the country much more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so Corona is an accelerant, SPACs are an accelerant. We get a lot of accelerants right now around the industry. Um, we have you know, now announced Metro Mile has an announced SPAC merger, not yet completed. So we'll have to um, you know, watch that unfold, but that is pay per mile insurance, which um, of course becomes much more, much more immediate as a consequence of the Corona crisis and becomes much quicker to scale as a consequence of the emergence of SPACs. Yeah. Now you said, you know, we became active. We thought that SPACs were becoming more important, more central in the markets this year, and and then effectively became, um, you know, SPAC ambidextrous. We've actually we've actually had companies that we work with that have merged into SPACs, and then we have ourselves been involved with um, with one SPAC that that you mentioned. Yeah, it, it does seem like a great way to put um, intellectual capital to work in helping propel companies onto the next stage of their development, um, obviously alongside financing. So um, good good for the industry as well, because hopefully it will help to bring up companies like the Clovers and the Metro Mall of, of the world and propel them with expertise from their industries as well. Um, as the well, you know, Clover and Metro, since you mentioned them, and then, you know, actually Lemonade and Root did conventional IPOs this year. Yeah. But this generation of InsurTech companies, you know, the popular imagination about InsurTech for a long time was it's going to disintermediate the industry. And I was always suspicious of that. You know, the buying insurance is just terrible. It's terrible. You've got to think about bad things that will happen, quantify those, put them into a legal framework and then send money to people that you hope never to get back. Like nobody wakes up in the morning wanting to do any of those things. And, and that's why you do it with your brother-in-law. Like that's, you know, insurance, the, the, the insurance at some level is a human business because it involves very emotional issues uh, around understanding risk in your life or in your corporate existence and then measuring that. So, you know, the, the notion that people are going to pop online and just do, Outside of outside of maybe some compulsory lines, that always seemed that always seemed like a big lift to me. Mm -hmm. um, but this generation, like, look at these four companies, like, really, really attacking, really attacking customer experience. And you know, let's. I, I think that in every insurance discussion, we should say customer experience like fourteen times to make up as a penance to make up for um, it, as an is. industry, as an industry, not having customer experience front and center. Um, yeah. because... I, I would certainly go along with that. And I'd also introduce product design as well, rather than just following on with the same old products year after year. Um, I think that the industry has a, a real opportunity to develop new product categories for itself as well at the moment. Um, as you've yeah. explained in some of your comments. Um, so if we were to 
bring this back to the ILS market as that is our main audience um, and thinking about this sort of the next 10 years being a period of really accelerating change for the industry yeah. overall. Give us some of your some of your thoughts on what what might happen in ILS. What could we see change? How could how could the structures change? Perhaps the, the collateral change. I don't know. Is there anything you see as a need for the ILS market for its health for the next ten years? Well, number one, the factors that made the whole enterprise interesting in 1996 are, if anything, more important in 2021. And I expect that they will be more important still in 2031. So let's quickly review those. Number one, um, non-correlation. You know, correlation going from, from years to months to weeks. You know, we're going to have a financial crisis in the next 10 days. And from, from, from the time the starting gun is fired on that crisis until, you know, the 18th, sector of the markets crashes is going to be, you know, 18 hours. And so non-correlation is going to become steadily more important. Yield. So price per unit of risk and then yield. $17 trillion of bonds around the world trade at or through zero right now. Um, interest rates are low. Interest rates are low, and I have this discussion with, with Rich Carbone, who I've been blessed with as an advisor at, HUD, at Hudson. Um, you know, every week we, we, we talk about some iteration of this. How can we be in a regime where every central bank on earth is printing money with abandon and, and rates are still zero? Because, um, and, and I expect some version of this to continue. We could have a kick up of inflation. All this printing is, 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 is I mean, if you lived through the 70s, it, it feels dangerous. Mm -hmm. But there is titanic deflation in the world. Um, there's deflation for all sorts of reasons. Tech is deflation. I was, I was trying to, I was talking about this with Rich yesterday. I was saying, how is tech inflation? Because in 1985, I had to like put into my backpack, you know, I, first of all, not a phone, but like a camera, you know, an address book, you know, um, my cat, my schedule, my calendar, you know, photo album, um, also, you know, a, a newspaper, some magazines, um, you know, if it, once we had, you know, phones, a phone, and, and what do I have to put in now? I can put this in my pocket. You know, this is, this is deflation. Mm. This is all sorts of product categories being eaten. This is newspaper printing presses shutting down everywhere. Switch carbon. Thinking of us. Um, I'll call him back. Um, so it, Globalization is deflation. Um, tech, you know, by, by unlocking fracking, we no longer have peak oil, we have peak oil demand. So there's a reasonable prospect of extended low rates. Um, printing could undo that, but there is a reasonable prospect. And so um, we could go through a period where the yield available is, is really compelling. Yeah. So non-correlation yield and then quantification. You know, everybody, you know, the models, the models didn't have their most glorious time in, in 2017, but, you know, but they're adapting. And the fact that there is pervasive and engaging modeling available in so many parts of the industry is important. And, and, and you know, computation and tech are going to empower that modeling, um, especially as data recovery is going to refresh and nourish models more speedily. So, you know, I think that the industry is going to become, you know, continue to be important in CAT. It's going to appear across more sectors. Um, there are new companies appearing that have no particular connection with the traditional folkways of the industry. So um, I, I think that we will see steady growth in the capital markets for reinsurance over the next 10 years. Uh, may, maybe we will be talking about, you know, a good size. Auto is going to become cattier. We may have 
we may have 10 years from now, you know, reasonably sized cyber business interruption in auto sectors. So in, in a decade's time, if we do this uh, interview again, we can be talking about the, the changes in auto and how that brought new opportunity to ILS investors, perhaps. We, we will be. We will be because auto will change more than it has changed, you know, since 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 grandpa came back from World War Two. So we will be. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I really appreciate your time. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk to you and hear your insights and your thoughts on the industry. I appreciate you taking part in this with me. Thank you, Steve. And I'll look forward. We're going to all be vaxxed and, and we're going to have we're going to schedule an event. It's going to be DS twenty three, um, you know the 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 twenty fifth anniversary party. It's going to be it's going to be huge. Great. I will certainly be there just for an opportunity to get abroad again. <laughs> yeah. um, thanks for your time, Michael. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve.